Open your Bibles to James in chapter 4, verse 8. That would be outstanding. I'm back to saying open your Bibles. When I started, I used to say turn your Bibles on. The Marsh, you like that? He turned his Bible on. I, I still open mine. I still open mine. But the title for today's sermon is Get Yourself Ready for Christmas. Get Yourself Ready for Christmas. And look right there, Brother Freddie, great job. He came to me between services. He said, I think I can find a manger scene to put up on the big screen. That's a good job, man. Good job. So we're getting ourselves ready for Christmas today. So I thought, boy, oh boy, I could give a great history lesson because I can read some books now. I enjoy reading about the manger scene. I could tell you all about how it was probably a cave and not a stable like we think of today built out of wood. All right, I can tell you that the trough was probably dug in stone as opposed to the, the manger that we think of today with all of our pictures. I, can t- I could probably impress you with some intelligence if I read enough. And I could portray that scene. I could tell you about the wise men traveling from in western Kentucky and lower Alabama from a fire somehow. I don't know how they traveled from a fire, but, uh, but afar, some people would say. And the Bible says they traveled from afar. So, I could tell you those things. The problem with that is, we're still 24 days away from celebrating Christ's birth as an official holiday. So how are we going to get ourselves ready for Christmas in the next 24 days where we can fully experience, fully enjoy what God has provided for us through His Son, Jesus Christ? How are we going to get there? And any type of illustration, any type of history lesson, any type of great sermon that I could give you on the birth story of Jesus our Christ isn't what God has in store for you this morning. He might have that for you this afternoon on the radio. He might have it for you if you're watching uh, television this evening. But right here, God wants to speak to you about something else. He wants you to hear this. He wants you to hear this, and he wants you to learn from it and grow from it. Because it's always my goal when I get to speak to people about our Savior, that when you leave, you're better off in your relationship with Jesus than when you came in the door. With that being said, I'm going to say something, and the sermon is based upon something that is kind of a a taboo in many Baptist settings. But I'm going to tell you, And we're going to study today that your blessings in life, your day-to-day contentment with your life, your harmony with other people is conditional. And we don't like to hear that. Salvation is free. But those other things that I've mentioned to you are conditional upon the decisions and the choices that you make as a child of God. Do not lose sight of that. I do not want to come up here preaching against anyone that says anything against simple salvation. Because it is true. In the Bible, it says, John 3, 16. Turn there if you want to. And possibly you have never said these words to Jesus. And if you've never said these words to Jesus, I promise you, if you say them, he's listening. But in John 3, 16, the Bible tells us that God so a lot of emphasis right there with that word so. Love the world that he gave his only son, that if you'll believe in him, if you'll put your trust in Jesus, you'll have eternal life. That is important. It's a free gift. Nothing you can do to earn it. It's an internal change, a gift from God. And I'm not even going to get into all the ins and outs on if the prayer actually has to be said aloud or not. But it is a change of heart. But once you accomplish that, then there are some things that are conditional. I haven't had the opportunity to uh, counsel a great number of people, but I have in my daily job, in my vocation, I deal with some people that have some issues, some things going on. Sometimes a little deeper than what I have going on. We all have them. But it always strikes me as amazing how people can know the rules, can know right from wrong, choose, make a conscientious decision to do wrong, 
and then expect things to be right. It's not logical. Yet we all seem to do it, don't we? Some people on a grand level, some people on a smaller level. But don't we all catch ourselves doing that day to day? Sometimes moment to moment. Sometimes we can't even get out our next thought before we're doing it to ourselves. So to prepare yourself, to get yourself ready for Christmas over the next 24 days, how are you going to get there? How are you going to experience this season to the best of your ability? How are you going to experience this season exactly the way God intends for you to experience it? So we've all been shopping. If you haven't yet, you're going to have to go. We're hopefully all going to have plenty of food on the table because we're a blessed nation right here in the United States. We're a blessed nation. Don't lose sight of that. We're hopefully going to be, be able to be around some family. Hopefully we'll all have safe travels. And I do not want to detract from any of those things. But God is not concerned with those things per se. God is concerned with your obedience to his word. He is concerned with your heart. So, here we are. James chapter 4, verse 8. I'm just going to read the first per part of the verse 8 first, if that's all right with you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I'm going to stop right there. That's pretty clear. We have the book of James. Pretty solid evidence because of writing styles that James, the author of this book, is the half-brother of Jesus. He did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus was the Christ, originally. But he did come to believe that. James also was able to beat Jesus after the resurrection. And sometimes don't we kind of wish that we could have been there to see him? Boy, it'd be... Sometimes life would be a little easier if we could have actually seen him, touched him, talked to him. No doubt about it now. Problem is, even the apostles they even had, or his disciples as you would know them, they had some trouble with belief, even after they did see him, and after they actually knew for sure he had been resurrected. So a little bit of question and doubt is nothing new to us. Nothing new at all, because the truth of the matter is, you've seen God work in your life, and I've seen God work in mine. Yet for some crazy, stupid reason, we all have doubt pop in every once in a while. Isn't that amazing? How fickle we are. How fickle we are. In Second Chronicles, talking about with the nation of Israel, God again and again says, if my people will follow me and obey me, then I will take care of them. That's a paraphrase. And again, right here in the book of James, a believer, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. James is telling us, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. That puts a lot of importance on what we're doing. That puts a lot of importance on what our heart is leading us to do. Make no mistake about it, you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. But your day-to-day -day life, your day-to-day -day ability to enjoy this life to the fullest is based on your obedience and your willingness and desire to draw near to our God. We always do something when I preach. Some of you are ready for it, some of you aren't. First service, it's 8, 15, 8, 20 in the morning. Brother Kelly Bowen was the only person ready. Brother Jason Beasley, I'm counting on you here. But some others that have been here before. Let's give it a shot. God is good? All the time. Solid. All the time? If you didn't know it, now you can go. Now you can go with us. It works best if you're smiling when you say it. All right? I see some frowny faces. I'm just letting you know. Saying those things, kind of affirmation, you're affirming to yourself, not to me, how good God is. All right? So try it with the frown turned upside down. My wife teaches first graders, so I know a lot of little things like that. All right? God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Remember that the gospel prospers during your good times and your bad times. God is in control of what's happening and going on around us. Well, let's go on and read a little bit, finish verse 8, and go into verse 9 and verse 10, if you don't mind. 
Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Boy, great words to prepare ourselves and get ourselves ready for Christmas. Great words. And we'll break it down here in just a second a little bit in uh, uh, Benton, Kentucky-ish English. Or uh, for those of you from Lower Alabama, Lower Alabama, L.A. English. So kind of we'll call it the, the j Powell translation for you a little bit to make it simple for all of us to make sure we're on the same page when we're walking out the door on what's going to make us ready and enjoy this Christmas season to the best of our ability as humans. Anybody watch football game last night? Brother Rudy already alluded to it. University of Alabama played Auburn University. Quite the game. The odd thing about it is I, I coach for a living. And uh, <laughs> Friday night we had a game, and we were up 13 points at halftime. I'm laughing now, I promise. If, if there had been a video camera in the locker room after the game, you probably would have said, I ain't going to listen to that man talk about the Bible. The, uh, I mean, it was. Yeah, yeah, you probably wouldn't have. I was pretty angry. All right, so... We ended up losing the basketball game. I was furious. And you know what my main point trying to get across to the young man that I coach was? I said it a bunch of different ways. But the main point, if you'll do what I say, then this won't happen. How many times when they're watching film, probably on their chartered jet planes flying from Auburn to Tuscaloosa last night, do you think Coach Saban, and I can bring him up, because before him, Bob Knight was probably the best coach going, before him, John Wooden, but now, Auburn fans, don't throw any apples or rotten tomatoes at me, but Nick Saban's probably the best thing that's going in coaching, all right? And I have no ties to the University of Alabama whatsoever, but he's really good at what he does. How many times do you think that he and his assistants and all of those millions upon millions of dollars they're making pointed up at the television screen and the thought and the phrase was used, he didn't do what we've told him to do. Another way of saying it, our players were disobedient tonight. The players were disobedient Sorry, Auburn, but I think person for person, Alabama probably has a better team and is going to win seven out of ten times. But the game that mattered, because Alabama's players were not as obedient, Auburn took advantage of it and they won the game. Now, don't get caught up with that, my statement on seven out of ten times. All that's just personal opinion. The fact of it is perfect obedience and submission to authority, leads to success. We have a state attorney in the first service for, for this area, and, and I, I mentioned to him, I would guarantee you there's some people that think he's a pretty mean guy. My daddy was in here the first, in the first service. He was my father, my preacher, and the principal of the school that I went to in middle school. I had no chance of doing anything wrong. Obedience was just a given. The, uh, I'm as big as he is now, um, but he was a big, towering fellow, bigger than he is now, and he would swing that leather belt like it was a softball bat right across my rear end. Made it very easy to obey. <laughs> the, uh, made it very, very easy to just try to do what's right all the time. But it, <laughs> it would crack me up. Fortunately, I had a good... Uh, Good attitude about it, I guess. But there would be children, uh, young adults, whatever they like to be called, teenagers in middle school. We'd be walking through the halls, and there'd be a kid, and he'd say, Golly, your dad sure is mean. Said, well, really? What happened? Well, I got a fight, in a fight out in the hallway, and he yelled at me and gave me four days or five days in school suspension. I was like, well, yeah. The, uh, well, are you supposed to fight in school? No. Well, I mean, did you know that? 
Yeah, I know I'm not supposed to fight in school. Well, what's the punishment normally if you get caught fighting in school? Oh, you get in-school suspension. We called it A-school back then, alternative school. That probably made somebody feel bad, so they changed it to in-school suspension. <laughs> the, so with that being said, I would always reply with, what did you expect to happen? You knew the rules. You didn't follow the rule. You got caught not following the rule, and so you got in trouble. Now, I was a decent-sized young adult too, so I mean, I didn't have to worry about them beating me up necessarily for, you know, confronting them with their silliness. But isn't that silliness? Yet we do that. We know right from wrong, we do wrong, and then we get all up in arms, worked up, mad, how could God do this to me? He's in control of everything, I believe it. And now here you go, I'm talking from experience, baby. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking from experience because I've thought it and said it and lived it myself. We, we're silly on that fact as humans. Obedience is the way to get the most of this Christmas season. Your day-to-day -day contentment depends on your obedience. So we're in the book of James. We've read the book of, or the the passage for today. As we look at it, we've already covered. I've got five points. They're quick. They're not like five points, and then within each point, I've got three points. It's not like that. I'm not that smart. The, we've got five points, though, to draw from this passage. All right? We've got five points for you. If you, if you like jotting stuff down, my wife's one of these people. She doesn't feel like she's been to church if she hasn't, like written out a bunch of stuff, all right? The, uh, maybe you're not. I was more, always more of just a, you know, auditory learner. I could listen. That's why my college degree's in history. Didn't have to study that much. I'd go sit in class. That guy up front was going to say what he thought was important. I'd go in there for a month. I'd walk in with a little blue book, and basically I just had to write down page after page of what he had already told me. I could do that, all right? But whatever type of learner you are, make the most of it. Because I desire for you to be better off when you walk out than when you walked in. Point number one. Your joy, you truly being ready for this Christmas is conditional. Your life will not be joyous. And we can split hairs as Christians about the difference in between being joyful and being happy. Let's just keep it real. You are not going to be as happy a person as you could be if you are not obedient to God. Your salvation, that's taken care of. And I don't even really like to use this term. Your salvation is by your faith. All that can be if you let it be, it's fire insurance. If you're not careful, the world will convince you. The Baptist church will convince you. The Methodist church will convince you, Brother West. That you're saved by your faith. And then once you're saved, that's good enough. Because God is so gracious. So merciful. Oh, and aren't those great qualities that our Savior has? Amen, they are. But you are not going to get the most of this life if you are totally, always, day to day, just wanting to rely and count on God's grace and mercy. You've got to know they're there. You've got to be thankful for them. You've got to know that you're so lowly as a human being that you couldn't even start to imagine life without them. But it is our job, because our relationship with him, once we become a Christian, is conditional. It is our job to stay on point. It is our job to stay obedient. So point number one is that your daily walk is conditional. Number two, point number two, in verse eight, cleanse your hands, you sinners, 
Get away from sin. Cleanse your hearts. Cleanse your hands. I'm not going to ask, but I would guess that most people in here would want to say something like this. Well, I wasn't at the club at 4 a.m. Well, I wasn't running around on my wife or I wasn't running around on my husband last night. So, hey, I'm doing pretty good. Wrong. Those things are extremes. And it, those, those extremes happen to people that, the, that society would consider pretty good people overall and all around. Those extremes do occur. But God wants more than that from you and for you. God's desire is that that little thing that keeps you from being as close and committed to Him as you possibly could be, He wants it gone. He wants your hands washed of it. So point number two is stay away from sin. You know when it's there. You know when you're dabbling or when you're not. God knows that He didn't create you stupid. He created you very intelligent. You're his prized creation as a human. Dare I say, even more prized than the angels. So make sure that you get away from sin. Then we move on. In verse 8, purify your hearts, you double-minded. This isn't point three, but I love the way that James says hearts, but then says double-minded. We like to talk about mamas do this, you know, a lot. My mama probably would. Well, he's a good boy. He's got a good heart. Yet he does everything wrong. He's in trouble all the time. At what point are you no longer good? Sorry if you don't like that from me. But there comes a point where you just have to call the spade a spade. But in our society, y'all ever kind of get sick of that? Or is that just me? Oh, he's a good guy. He just makes some bad decisions. Oh, he's got a good heart, though. He's got a good heart. At what point can we not step up and say, no, bad heart, bad person, better change? Is that so hard to do? And if as humans, as Americans, we would say that a little more often about me, about you, yourself possibly, well, all of a sudden we'd start to see a little turn in the way things are looked at, I believe. But we love saying it, don't we? We love saying, well, he's good-hearted. But the Bible teaches against that. The Bible teaches that God created us as a whole. So I know that there's a soul inside of me And I know that we like to talk about God saving our soul. But God saves all of us. There's not just a little pocket in there somewhere that we call a soul that's the only thing that God saved. He either saves all of you or he saves none of you. So don't compartmentalize that. Make sure that what your heart is saying, your mind is thinking. And what your mind is thinking, your heart is feeling. And make sure you're doing what both are telling you to do. Because you know what our mind will tell us? Or this happens to me, maybe not to you. Well, I need, no, I don't need it. I know God wants me to go this route with my life. I know that. But here are the problems. It's not very practical because... We need something called money. So I can't go do that. So my mind says, this is what my heart's leading me to do. But my mind says, I will do these things to try to pacify God. That way, I really won't have to face reality and go do what he has called me to do. 
or I will not have to be who he has called me to be, which is even more important than doing, the being is. Anybody else ever felt that way? Up and down means yes, side to side, no. You try to get into that little game of let's, let's make a deal, God. I don't want to do what you called me to do. I don't want to do what you've told me to do. But I'll do this over here because it's pretty convenient. I'll go be a deacon, Brother Jason. You'll go be a deacon, won't you? I'll go serve dinner for the community on Monday night. Pretty convenient. I'm off work by 5 o'clock anyway. There's nothing wrong with those things. There's people on this planet. They might have been in the first service. Tony, they might be in here. Tony, Jennifer, Isaac, Rob, and Donna McDonald. There's four people right there. Stephanie Roberts. There's five people right there. They were called by God himself to lead our community dinners on Monday night. They have greater purposes and other purposes too, but those five individuals right there, God has called to do that. So I'm not downplaying that. My point is we will try to do things out of convenience to pacify what God actually intends for us to do. And guess what? That's disobedience. So you will not receive the blessings. You will not receive the day-to-day peace. You will not receive the contentment that you should have as long as you are putting off what God wants you to do. So point three was that your hearts and your minds are together. Make sure your hearts are pure. Make sure you're not double-minded. Make sure you're not concerned about the practicality of it. And also, I want to touch base with this. Here's another thing that keeps us doing what our heart leads us to do. And this is just admitting to my spoiledness. Sometimes I want to go have fun. Something's going on at the church house, but I want to go do something that's fun. I want to go on this trip. Something needs to be done. It's not very fun, though. So our mind convinces us to not do what our heart knows to do. Then we have ourselves working against each other internally. Leads to failure. Number four. I couldn't give any examples because mom and dad were in here first service. (laughs) But have you ever done anything and it's... Maybe not as soon as you did it, but pretty close to as soon as you did it, like your stomach just dropped. Like, oh my goodness. I did not just do that. Amen. I guess I'm admitting now that I have done it. And most of those things, it still happens, but not as regularly as it did when I was younger. Find a way for the sin that you have in your life And when you do sin, either by not doing something you're supposed to do or committing a sin, doing something you weren't supposed to do, either way, allow yourself to feel awful about it. That's hard to say. What about grace? What about mercy? What about... Feeling good about ourselves. It's important. Everyone needs a healthy ego. Self-esteem. But allow yourself to have that same feeling in your stomach that you had when you were a child and you felt awful about what you had done and the fear that you were going to get caught. That type of feeling and not wanting that feeling anymore will cause you to change. Don't allow yourself to be so callous that when you sin, God's got it. Because that was not his intention through his grace and through his mercy. God's intention was through his grace and his mercy that when you sin, he's forgiven you. But that you change your ways and you don't do it again or again, or again. Make sure that you follow that. And then the fifth point, in order for you to fully 
be prepared for Christmas is know in the bottom of your heart, all the way through your being, that you are absolutely nothing without God. He provides everything you have. He is in total control. Boy, that's kind of on the edge there. But he is in total control of what does happen and what does not happen. Some people believe, and you might be one of them, but I'm the one preaching. You're not, so I get to say what the Lord's put on my heart. Some people believe that we are nothing more than originally a bunch of gases that came together Boom, and life, earth began, time, things change, things adapt. All this time, here we are. My issue with that, and I'm not for sure exactly how God spoke it into being, but my issue with that is this. There is right and wrong. And if there is no creator, then everything is subjective to what we as humans decide. So our society, I'm going to use an extreme case. So our society right now views the awful thing, heaven forbid it ever happens to anyone, of rape as being wrong. But here is the scary part about if there is no creator and there is no right and wrong. As soon as most people in our society decided to change and say that rape isn't wrong, then it would no longer be wrong because all the laws would be man-made. So the only way for the world to make sense is for truth for creation to come from a higher being that is in total control. Because if not, then we're all just making up everything as we go. And we're all just relying on each other to be good. I don't want y'all relying on me to be good. And I know some of you, I'm not relying on y'all to be good. That sounds like a bad idea. So know in the depths of your soul that God is God. And while I mentioned earlier that you're his prized creation, you are still nothing. I am still nothing compared to God. So as we get close to closing today, as I mentioned earlier, I hope that when you leave here, you can be a little more prepared to experience and celebrate Christmas. I hope that you can take the fact that I didn't use, here we are, 24 days from the big day. I didn't take some historical approach to baby Jesus being born. I didn't take the virgin birth. I did not take the manger did not take the wise men. I did not take the shepherds. I did not take King Herod. None of that historical approach. Because God wants you to fully experience Christmas. And there will come a time that you're going to hear that. And there's a time and place for it. And there are great stories. There are true stories. But for you to be prepared to fully experience Christmas, then you have got to make sure that you're obedient. To what God wants you to do. Not only with your doing and your service to your church, but obedient with your actions. Not doing things that are against what the Bible teaches us to do. Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament and the prophets. He didn't come to get rid of them. He made them all come to light. You can't get to heaven by following the Ten Commandments. The whole reason the Ten Commandments were written is to prove that we're all sinners. Not to give us something to try to reach up to, as it's so often taught. 
But once you accept Jesus as your Savior, you have your fire insurance, people. But if you want to truly live a joyous, glorifying God life, that you have contentment and peace, you obey what God tells you to do. Bow your heads, please. Father God.